We find that the international media they are bombarding misinformation about Islam. Some of the international news channels they are saying war for peace. The Islamic madrasas should be banned. Why? Because they produce human beings who cause terror. Ladies and gentlemen, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Greetings and peace be on all of you. I request Brother Arif Zulfar of Dubai International Holy Quran Award Committee to come up and take the mic at the stage. Brother Arif Zulfar, please. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله Dear Honored Guest Dr. Zakir Naik Ladies and Gentlemen Under the patronage of His Highness Sheikh Mohammed bin Rashid Al Maktoum Crown Prince of Dubai and UAA Minister of Defense Dubai International Holy Quran Award has the pleasure again in its ninth session to welcome our dear guest, Dr. Zakir Naik. Tonight's lecture, as you know, media and Islam, war or peace. Proceeding to that, I'd like to ask Dr. Hamad Naik and Farik Zakir Naik to proceed to the stage to hear some holy verses from the Holy Quran. Farikh Naik is the son of Dr. Zakir. Please. <laughs> ألم تر كيف فعل ربك بعاد إرم ذات العماد التي لم يخلق مثلها في البلاد وسمود الذين جابوا الصخر بالواد وفرعون ذي الأوتاد الذين تغوا في البلاد فأكسروا فيها الفساد فصب عليهم ربك صوت عذاب إن ربك لبالمرصاد فأما الإنسان إذا ما ابتلاه ربه فأكرمه ونعم فيقول ربي أكرما وأما إذا ما ابتلاه فقدر عليه رزقه فيقول ربي أهانا كلا بل لا تكرمون اليتيم ولا تحاضون على طعام المسكين وتأكلون الطواس أكلا لما وتحبون المال حبا جما كلا إذا دكت الأرز دكا دكا وجاء ربك والملك صفا صفا وجاء يومئذ بجهنم يومئذ يتذكر الإنسان وأنا له الذكرى يقول يا ليتني قدمت لحياتي فيومئذ لا يعذب عذابه أحد ولا يوسق وساقه أحد يا أيتها النفس المطمعنة ارجعي إلى ربك غاضية مرضية فادخلي في عبادي وادخلي جنتي صدق الله العظيم The translation of the Kirat Surah Al-Fajr 
the dawn. In the name of Allah, most gracious, most merciful. By the break of day, by the nights twice five, by the even and odd contrasted, and by the night when it passeth away. Is there not in these an adjuration or evidence for those who understand? Seest thou not how thy Lord dealt with the Ard people, with the city of Iram, with lofty pillars, the like of which were not produced in all the land, and with the Tamud people, who cut out huge rocks in the valley, and with Pharaoh, lord of stakes, all these transgressed beyond bounds in the lands, and heaped therein mischief on mischief. Therefore did thy Lord pour on them a scourge, of diverse chastisements, for thy Lord is as a guardian on a watchtower. Now as for man, when his Lord trieth him, giving him honor and gifts, then saith he, puffed up, my Lord hath honored me. For when he trieth him, restricting his subsistence for him, then saith he in despair, my Lord hath humiliated me. Nay, nay, but ye honor not the orphans, nor do ye encourage one another to feed the poor, and ye dear inheritance all with greed, and ye love wealth with inordinate love. Nay, when the earth is pounded to powder, and the Lord cometh, and his angels rank upon rank, and hell that day is brought face to face, on that day will man remember. But how will that remembrance profit him? He will say, Ah, would that I had sent forth good deeds for this my future life. For that day his chastisement will be such as none else can inflict, and his bonds will be such as none can bind. To the righteous soul will he be said, O thou soul, in complete rest and satisfaction, come back thou to thy Lord, well pleased thyself and well pleasing unto him. Enter thou then among my devotees, yea, enter thou my heaven. A small brief uh, again of Dr. Zakir Naik, a medical doctor by a professional training. Dr. Zakir Nayat is renowned as a dynamic international orator on Islam and comparative religion. Dr. Zakir clarifies Islamic viewpoints and clears misconceptions about Islam using the Quran, authentic hadith of the Prophet وسلم, and other religious scriptures as a basis in conjunction with reason, logic and scientific facts. Dr. Zakir is 39 years old. He is popular for his critical analysis and convincing answers to challenging questions posed by audiences after his public talks. In the last 10 years, Dr. Zakir Nayak has delivered more than 1,000 public talks in the USA, Canada, UK, Saudi Arabia, UAE, Kuwait, Qatar, Bahrain, Australia, New Zealand, and many, many other countries. Now my pleasure to ask Dr. Zakir Naik to proceed to the stage. So please, you are welcome. Alhamdulillah. Was salatu was salam. Ala Rasulillah. وَآلَ آلِ وَسَابِ أَجْمَئِنَ أما بعد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وقل جاء الحق وزاق الباطل إن الباطل كان زهوكا رب شوالي صدري ويسل لي أمري وحل الأقدة من لساني يفقه قولي Respected Mr. Arif Julfar My respected elders and my dear brothers and sisters, I welcome all of you with the Islamic greetings. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. May peace, mercy, and blessings 
of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, of Almighty God, be on all of you. It's an honor and a pleasure for me to be invited by the Holy Quran Award Dubai under the patronage of Sheikh Muhammad bin Rashid Al Maktoum as a guest speaker to give two talks in this glorious month of Ramadan. The topic of this evening's talk is media and Islam, war or peace. Media, by definition, is means of mass communication. Media is means of mass communication. And Islam is derived from the word Salam, which means peace. It's also derived from the Arabic word Islam, which means to submit your will to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to Almighty God. So in short, Islam means peace acquired by submitting your will to Almighty God. Thus, the topic of this evening's talk is means of mass communication and peace acquired by submitting your will to Almighty God. War or peace? Today we have to agree that media is one of the most important tools. Or rather you can say, media today is one of the most important weapon. This media can convert black to white. It can change day into night. It can convert a hero into a villain and a villain into a hero. This media, means of mass communication, can do wonders. And depending upon how science and technology advance, the methods of media are also advancing. Today, the means of mass communication, that is media, can be broadly classified under four headings. First, we have the print media which is further divided into non-periodical and periodical print media. In non-periodical print media, we have literature like pamphlets, booklets, books, etc. In the periodical print media, we have newsletters, newspapers, magazines, which are printed either daily, weekly, fortnightly, monthly, quarterly, annually. This is the first type of media, that is the print media. The second type of media is the audio media. Today, we have audio media in the form of audio tapes, which are becoming obsolete. Next is the audio CD, compact disc. We also have lately the DAT, digital audio tape. This audio media can either be used by an individual person at his home, at his office, or in a vehicle he's traveling in a car, etc., by having an audio player. It can even be used while walking like a walkman. It can be used in gatherings, small groups, functions, parties, weddings, gatherings such as this. Or it can be used on a mass public level through the radio broadcast station. The third type of media we have is the video media, which again today is available in the form of VHS, video home system cassettes, which again is dying out. It is becoming obsolete. We also have the VCD, video CD, which too is becoming obsolete. Today we have video on the media, DVD, digital video disc. And the next generation of video which has just started is the HD DVD, high definition digital video disc. The other one coming in the market is the Blu-ray. All these are types of video media. This too can be used on individual level at home, in the office, 
in a vehicle, in groups, in gatherings, or in public, in mass level, through the television broadcast station, satellite channels, cable TVs. The last media we have is the computer media or the IT, information technology, which again can be used on individual level, in groups, and in mass public. It can be used in the way of internet. This again can be stored in the form of diskette, CDs, hard disk, and variety. In short, we have four types of media. Print media, audio media, video media, and the computer media. Each media requires a specialization. Each media has its disadvantage and advantage. For example, the print media can be carried very easily in comparison to the audio or the video media. But as technology is improving, we find that this gap is reducing. Today's scientific research tells us that the retention of each type of media, it keeps on differing. When an average human being, when he reads the print media, he retains approximately 10% of what he has read on an average. When a person hears the audio media, an average human being, he retains approximately 20% of what he has heard. When a human being sees the visual, any picture, any visual, an average human being retains approximately 30% of what he has seen. But when a human being sees and hears at the same time, simultaneously, that is the video, audio and video together, an average human being retains approximately 50% of what he has heard and seen. So the best in terms of retention is the video media. Today we know that the international media, whether it be the print media, the audio media, the video media, or the computer, or the IT technology, whether it be the international newspapers, international magazines, radio broadcast station, websites, or the television satellite channels. We find on the international media, there is virulent propaganda about Islam. We find that the international media, they are bombarding misinformation about Islam. We find that there are various misconceptions about Islam that are spread on this international media. And we find that international news channels, they are mentioning war on terror. Or some of the international news channels, they are saying war for peace. Actually, what they're doing is not war for peace, war on peace. In other words, war on the region of peace, on Islam. The international media as a whole today, we find that they are projecting Islam as though it is a religion of terror. It's a religion which does not want peace to prevail. And unfortunately, we Muslims, unfortunately, we aren't really replying to this international media and there are various techniques that are used by this international media to project Islam in a wrong way. The first strategy used by the media to malign Islam is many a times they pick up the black sheep amongst the Muslim community and they portray as though they are exemplary Muslims, indicating that Islam is a religion which encourages these wrong things. We have to agree that there are black sheep in our community. There are some Muslims who do illegal activity. They pick up these selected 
Muslims, and they portray on the media as though they're exemplary Muslims, giving a picture to the world that Islam is a religion which encourages these illegal activities, these activities which are against humanity. And all of us know today that the international media says that the Islamic madrasas should be banned. Why? Because they produce human beings who cause terror, who disrupt the peace of this world. Alhamdulillah, I know thousands of people, human beings, who have passed from Islamic madrasas. I don't know a single who encourages and propagates the disruption of peace. That does not mean that there will not be any Muslims who have passed from madrasa who may be propagating wrong things. There may be a few. Surely it will be less than 1%. But the media portrays these Muslims as though they are exemplary Muslims and as though a person who passes from madrasa is an exemplary student who disrupts peace in this world. History tells us today that the human being that has killed the maximum number of human beings in this world, who is he? Who is the man who has killed the maximum human beings in this world? Who is that person? Who is he? Hitler. You don't get an award for that. It is common knowledge. Hitler. Which madrasa did Hitler pass from? From which madrasa did Hitler graduate? And you go down history. We know Mussolini. He has killed thousands of human beings. Which madrasa did he pass from? We know today that the mafia, the top drug dealers in the world, which madrasa did they pass from? You take a list of all the top criminals in the world, not what the media portrays. Actually, if you have proof what they've done is wrong, I'm not bothered what the media portrays, who is terrorist number one, etc., without any proof. But those who have been imprisoned, those who have been proved to be causing disharmony in this world, if you check the background, you will not even find 1%, 0.1% of them who have passed from madrasa. They have passed from these universities, the one that even I have passed from. Fortunately, unfortunately, even I have passed from the normal formal education system. I have passed from Bombay. After doing my schooling, I have passed from medical college. Same, like a normal doctor. So this is how the media picks up blacks in the community and portray as though they are exemplary Muslims. If a person wants to judge Islam, he should not judge Islam based on what individual Muslims do or what the Muslim society does. If you want to judge about the religion of Islam, you have to judge according to the authentic sources. And the authentic sources of Islam are the glorious Quran and the authentic Sayyid Hadith of the last and final Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. And I challenge anyone, any human being, to point out a single teaching from the Quran or the Sahih Hadith which is against humanity as a whole. Imagine you want to test how good a car is and the latest car in the market, Mercedes 600 SEL has been launched and a person who does not know how to drive the car, he sits behind the steering wheel and he bangs up the car. Who will you blame, the car or the driver? Who will you blame, the car or the driver? But naturally the driver. If the driver does not know how to drive the car and he bangs up the car, you will not blame the car. If you want to judge how good the car is, you will have to look at the specification of the car. What is its pickup? What are the safety measures? What is the speed? What is the gear ratio? And then you can tell how good the car is. And really, if you want to have a test drive, you put behind the steering wheel an expert driver. Similarly, if you want to observe any Muslim regarding how good Islam is, the best example we have is Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Don't look at me. Don't look at me how good Islam is. 
Don't look at the other Muslims or what the individual society does. Look at an expert driver or a person who knows how to follow Islam in totality. And that was the last and final message of Prophet Muhammad sallam. The other strategy used by the media to malign Islam is they quote many verses of the Quran out of context. And one of the most common verses quoted by the critics of Islam is Surah Tawbah, chapter number 9, verse number 5, which says, wherever you find a kafir, you kill him. And if you open the Quran, that verse is there. The translation is there. Wherever you find a kafir, you kill him. But it is out of context. They quote verses of the Quran out of context. They quote hadiths out of context. The context is when we start a few verses before, it's mentioned that there was a peace treaty between the Muslims and the Mushriks of Makkah. And this peace treaty was unilaterally broken by the Mushriks of Makkah. By the time Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reaches verse number 5 of Surah Tawbah chapter number 9, He is giving an ultimatum to the Mushriks of Makkah that you put things straight in four months time, otherwise a declaration of war. And in the battlefield, Allah says to the Muslims that don't get scared, fight. Wherever you find the enemy, you kill him. Now any army general, to boost up the morale of his soldiers, he will but naturally say that wherever you find the enemy, you kill him. He will not say that wherever you find the enemy, be killed. So this is in context in the battlefield. In the battlefield, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling, wherever you find the kafir, the enemy is attacking you, don't get scared, fight! And kill them wherever you find them. Imagine today, if there's a war going on between America and Vietnam, and the American president says, in the battlefield, he is boosting the morale of the American soldiers, or the army general of America says, that wherever you find a Vietnamese, you kill him. It's in context. But if I quote out of context and say, today the American president is saying, that wherever you find a Vietnamese, kill him, I will make him sound like a butcher. It is out of context. And throughout the world, either they put a full stop, or they jump to the next verse. And Arun Shuri, who is one of the staunchest critics of India where I come from, he writes in his book, The World of Fatwas. After quoting verse number 5 of Surah Tawbah, he jumps on to verse number 7. You know why? Because verse number 6 has the reply to his problem. Verse number 6 of Surah Tawbah says that if the kafir, if the enemy seek asylum, don't just let them go. It says escort him to a place of security so that he may hear the word of Allah. The most merciful the most merciful army general today in the battlefield will say, if the enemy wants to go, just let him go. But the Quran doesn't say, Quran says, if the enemy wants peace, don't just let him go, escort him to a place of security. And all the verses, almost all the verses, if you read in the Quran, which talk about fighting, mostly in the battlefield, or against oppression, against tyranny, the next verse that follows is, peace is better. Always. Because Islam is a religion of peace. The third strategy used by the media to malign Islam is they give a wrong meaning of the verses they quote, either of the Quran or the Hadith of the Prophet. The fourth strategy, they quote things which are alien to Islam. It doesn't exist in Islam, but they attribute it to Islam. And the fifth strategy used is they quote things of Islam correct, but they give it a different angle. What they say is a problem to humanity and they portray as though Islam is the problem for humanity. Actually, it is not a problem, it is the solution for the problems of humanity. I have given a talk, Islam the solution, not the problem for humanity. Time does not permit me to speak in detail on this subject. But these are the various strategies used by the media to malign Islam. And we find today on the international media that they call the Muslims as fundamentalists, as extremists, as terrorists. And most of us, the apologetic, no, you know, yes, I'm not a fundamentalist, you know. 
there are some people who are, who are fundamental. I'm, I'm not a fundamentalist. I'm not an extremist. Most of us Muslims, we are apologetic. We go on the defense. We Muslims should be dais. It is compulsory for every Muslim to convey the message of Islam to the others. Allah says in the Quran in Surah Al Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 110, Kuntum khaira ummatin ukhridat lin nas. O ye Muslims, ye are the best of people the world for mankind. Kuntum khaira ummatin ukhridat lin nas. Ta'miruna bil marufi wa tanhauna an munkar. Wa tu'minuna billah. Because we enjoin what is good, and we forbid what is wrong and we believe in Allah. We are called as the Khaira Ummah, the best of people because we are supposed to enjoy what is good and forbid what is wrong and believe in Allah. If we do not enjoy what is good and if we do not forbid what is wrong, we are unfit to be called as Muslims. We are unfit to be called as Khaira Ummah. We should be proud to call ourselves Muslims. We should know how to turn the tables over. I remember when I was doing martial arts in my young days, now also I'm young, mashallah. In my school days, I could say. We always taught in martial arts, whether it be judo, jiu-jitsu, that we should use the force of the opponent to throw him over, rather than resist. If someone is pushing me, and he's a big giant, you know, you can see my physique. Nothing great. Yet, I like not having any podium, because that's a technique of the media, not that I have a very good physique. I like my body language to be seen. So when someone who is a big giant who tries to use force against you, rather than resisting, use his force to throw him over. And bigger the person, the harder he falls. You know, the media today is calling Muslims as fundamentalists. What is the meaning of the word fundamentalist? Fundamentalist by definition means a person who follows the fundamentals of one particular subject. For example, if any person wants to be a good scientist, he should know, follow, and practice the fundamentals of science. Unless he's a fundamentalist in the field of science, he cannot be a good scientist. If a person wants to be a good mathematician, he should know, follow, and practice the fundamentals of maths. Unless he's a fundamentalist in the field of maths, he cannot be a good mathematician. We cannot paint all fundamentalists with the same brush, that all are good or all are bad. Depending in which field the person is a fundamentalist, you have to label him accordingly. For example, if we have a fundamentalist robber whose profession is to rob, he is bad for the society. On the other hand, if we have a fundamentalist doctor who saves thousands of human lives, he is good for the society. You can't paint all fundamentally the same brush. You have to find out what are his fundamentals before labeling him whether he's good or bad. As far as I'm concerned, I am a fundamentalist Muslim and I'm proud to be a fundamentalist Muslim. Because I know I follow and I strive to practice the fundamentals of Islam. And I know there is not a single fundamental of Islam which goes against humanity as a whole. There may be a few fundamentals of Islam which the non-Muslims may feel it is against humanity. But the moment you give the logical reason regarding these fundamentals and the statistics of the world, there is not a single human being who is unbiased who can point out a single fundamental of Islam which is against humanity as a whole. Therefore, I am proud to be a fundamentalist Muslim. When we read the Webster's Dictionary, we come to know that the word fundamentalism was first used to describe a group of Protestant Christians in America in the early part of the 20th century. Previously, the church, it believed that only the message of the Bible was from God. These Protestant Christians in America, in the early part of the 20th century, they protested that not only is the message of the Bible from God, but every word, every letter of the Bible is from God. If any person can prove that the Bible is the word of God, this movement is a good movement. On the other hand, if someone can prove that Bible is not the word of God, then this movement is not a good movement. When we read the Oxford Dictionary, we find 
that according to the Oxford Dictionary, the definition of the word fundamentalist is given. It says that fundamentalist is a person who strictly adheres to the ancient doctrine of any religion. But when we refer to the latest edition of Oxford Dictionary, there's a slight change. It says that fundamentalist is a person who strictly adheres to any ancient doctrine of any religion, especially Islam. The word especially Islam has been added to the definition. The moment you hear the word fundamentalist, you start thinking of a Muslim. He's an extremist, he's a terrorist. The media says that Muslims are extremists. I said, yes, I'm an extremist. I'm extremely kind, I'm extremely merciful, I'm extremely honest, I'm extremely just. What's wrong in being extremely kind, extremely merciful, extremely just, extremely honest? What's wrong? Can any human being tell me being extremely honest is bad? Can any human being point out to me that being extremely just is wrong? The Quran says we have to be extremely honest. We can't be partly honest. We can't be biased that if he's my friend, I'm honest. If he's my enemy, I'm not honest. We have to be honest and just with everyone. Quran says in Surah Baqarah, chapter 2, verse number 208, Enter into Islam wholeheartedly. So what's wrong in being an extremist? But we have to be extremists in the right direction. We should not be extremists in the wrong direction. We should not be merciless. We should not be violent. But we should be extremists in the right direction. That's what the Quran says. But unfortunately, we go on the defense. Oh, I'm not an extremist. I'm not a fundamentalist. Turn the tables over. Muslims today are labeled as terrorists. I say, every Muslim should be a terrorist. What is the meaning of the word terrorist? Terrorist by definition means a person who causes terror. When a robber sees a policeman, he's terrified. So for the robber, the policeman is a terrorist. So in this context, <laughs> in this context, whenever a robber, whenever a rapist, whenever any anti-social element looks as a Muslim, he should be terrified. We should terrify the anti-social element. That's what the Quran says in Surah Anfal, chapter number 8, verse number 60. Cause terror in the hearts of the anti-social element. I know that today the word terrorist is commonly used for terrorizing an innocent human being. In this context, no Muslim should ever terrorize any innocent human being. He should selectively terrorize the anti-social element. He should selectively terrorize the thief, the robber, the rapist. Whenever any anti-social element looks at a Muslim, he should be terrified. Then only can we have peace in this world. Many a times, two different labels are given for the same activity of that same individual. About 60, 70 years ago, before India got its freedom, the country where I come from, the Britishers were ruling India. There were many Indians who were fighting for the freedom of the country. These people, by the British government, they were called as terrorists. But the common Indians, we call them as freedom fighters, as patriots. Same people, same activity, but two different labels. If you agree with the view of the British government that they had a right to rule over India, then you have to call these people as terrorists. But if you agree with the view of the common Indians that the Britishers came to India to do business, they have no right to rule over us, then you'll have to call these people as patriots, as freedom fighters. Same people, same activity, but two different labels. And such examples, you can give multiple such examples in world history. A Dai should know if there are many examples, which example should you use where? So that he understands. Because Quran says in Surah Al-Imran, chapter 3, verse 64, Ta'ala wila kalmitin sawa im bainakum. Come to common terms as I send you. The moment the Indians, when they call Muslim terrorists, and when I give this example, then they understand the picture better. Two months back, I was in UK, after the bomb blast, after 7th of July. There was supposed to be a grand conference. Tony Blair, Jack Tor was supposed to come. Last moment, they didn't come. But the chief of police was there, the mayor was there. And there also I used the example. But my examples were different. I said that in the 18th century, we know of the American Revolution. The Britishers 
were ruling America. There were many Americans who were fighting for the freedom. In 1776, they got the freedom. And top of the line were Benjamin Franklin, George Washington. They were called as terrorist number one by the British government. The person who was terrorist number one, George Washington, later on, he becomes the president of USA. Imagine terrorist number one becomes the president of USA. And he is an example for all the presidents to follow, including George Bush. This is media. Terrorist number one becomes the president of the country which we look up upon. USA. USA's name comes the most advanced country in the world. Who was the person who was the first president? A terrorist. We have the example of Nelson Mandela. Before new South Africa was formed, South Africa was relieved from the white apartheid government. Nelson Mandela, by the white apartheid government, he was imprisoned for 25 years in Robben Islands. He was called as terrorist number one. Later on, when South Africa gets its freedom from the white apartheid government, he is made the president of new South Africa. And later on, he gets the Nobel Prize for Peace. And he doesn't get a Nobel Prize for Peace for a new activity. Not that he was a terrorist first, and then he did some good activities, and a bad person has become a good person. No, no. For the same activity for which he was called a terrorist, after a few years, he gets a Nobel Prize for Peace. It is weird. Same activity for which he was imprisoned for 25 years. He was called as terrorist for the same activity later on, he gets the Nobel Prize for Peace. So this is how the media can convert day into night, black into white, hero into a villain, and a villain into a hero. In short, whoever is in power, whatever he says, turns out to be the gospel truth. We know when Hitler was invading Europe, many countries were resisting. Even France, they resisted. These French people, by the Germans, they were called as terrorists. This is how the media paints a picture. Unfortunately, we Muslims, unfortunately, we are way behind. We should know how to turn the tables over. And today, the word which is maximum misunderstood in Islam, it is the word jihad. Not only is there misconception amongst the non-Muslims regarding the word jihad, there is even a misconception amongst many Muslims regarding the Arabic word jihad. Many people think that any war fought by any Muslim for any reason, whether it be for power, whether it be for personal gain, whether it be for money, it is called as jihad. Any war fought by any Muslim for any reason, whether it be for power, for personal gain, for money, is not called as jihad. Jihad is an Arabic word coming from the word jihada, which means to strive, which means to struggle. In Islamic context, it means to strive and struggle against one's own evil inclination. It also means to strive and struggle to make the society better. It also means to strive and struggle in the battlefield in self-defense. It also includes to strive and struggle against oppression. Jihad basically means to strive and struggle. If a student is striving and struggling to pass the examination, it means he's doing jihad. So jihad basically means to strive and struggle. And many of the non-Muslims, they translate the word jihad into English as holy war. And unfortunately, many so-called Muslim scholars in United Commerce, even they translate jihad as holy war. Holy war in Arabic, the word, if you want to translate holy war into Arabic, it is harbum muqaddasa. The word harbum muqaddasa does not exist anywhere in the Quran. It does not exist anywhere in any of the hadith of the Prophet 
This word holy war was first used to describe the crusaders. When the crusaders in the name of Christianity, they killed thousands of people. They termed it as a holy war. And today they're using that word for the Muslims. See how the media is. First they used the word fundamentalist for the Christians, now they use it for the Muslims. Holy war was used for the Christian crusaders, now they use it for the Muslims, saying jihad is holy war. Jihad basically means to strive and struggle. And every Muslim should be a dai. Our beloved Prophet said, it's a hadith of Sahih Bukhari, go aya. Propagate even if you know one verse. You can't say, no, I will wait till I become like Sheikh Ahmad Didad and then start doing dawah, the time will never come. Even if you know one verse of Islam, as long as you know it correctly, it's your duty to propagate it. Every Muslim should be a dai. The problem is we aren't following the commandments of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's the reason we are in this state. Allah says he will not help people who will not help themselves. Who is to blame? We are to blame. And after 9-11, it has reached epidemic levels, maligning Islam. And I had gone to USA two years back in October 2003. I had gone to Los Angeles. And I was prepared, wearing a tie and a coat, beard, cap, kufi. I was prepared that I will be questioned. A guy has to be prepared. So when I went to the immigration, oh, beard, cap, oh, go for inquiry. I was prepared. They asked me, why have you come here? I said, I'm getting an award. Award for what? I said, award for humanity. There's an organization in Los Angeles, in USA, giving me an award for humanity. What work have you done? I told him, I spread truth. Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, said, Seek ye the truth, and the truth shall free you. I'm a person who spread truth. I wasn't lying. I'm a dai. I'm spreading din al-haq, the religion of truth. And they asked me various questions to cut the incident in short. And I went to the custom, they opened my bag, and they found my video cassette, Jihad and Terrorism. <laughs> they asked me, do you believe in jihad? I said, yes. Even Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, believed in jihad. He said, you have to strive. Even I believe in striving. I believe in what Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, said that you have to strive. No, no, I mean, do you believe in fighting? I said, it is mentioned in the Bible. In the book of Exodus, chapter number 22, you have to fight. It's mentioned in the Bible. In the book of Exodus, chapter number 32, you have to fight. In the book of Numbers, chapter number 31, you have to fight. Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, says in the Gospel of Luke, chapter number 22, that take the sword and fight. But then the custom officer being a Christian, no, no, but that's in self-defense. I said, that's what even I fight for, self-defense. <laughs> they told me, sir, can I ask you one more question? I said, no problem. I just told my host that, you know, I'm just doing dawah in the immigration, don't bother. <laughs> I, as a dai, a dai should not get scared of truth. I started my talk by quoting the verse of the Quran from Surah Isra, chapter number 17, verse number 81. When truth is hurled against falsehood, falsehood perishes. For falsehood, it's by its nature bound to perish. And Alhamdulillah, after 9-11, everything has become strict, visas have become strict, but Alhamdulillah, I have traveled after 9-11 to USA, to Canada, to UK, to Australia, to Malaysia, to Singapore. And I've got 10 years visa of USA, 5 years visa of UK, Canada, 2 years visa, Alhamdulillah, Summa Alhamdulillah. Yet, I do not mince my words, I'm very clear. When I go for lectures, I say I've come for lectures. When I go for spreading truth, I say I've come for spreading the truth. Depending upon the situation where you are, Allah says in Surah Imran, chapter 3, verse 64, Come to common terms as in us and you. Many of you may be aware of the situation in India. It's not easy to do dawah, especially the city where I come from, Bombay. One of the most difficult place to do dawah, according to me, it is Bombay. But Allah is the one to protect. There itself I speak. I quote the Vedas. I quote the Bhagavad Gita. I quote the Upanishads. But there, my strategy changes. There are many Indians who say the Muslims are terrorists. This Quran, it propagates that you should fight. 
what kind of religious book is this? I tell them, have you read your Mahabharat? Mahabharat is one of the sacred scriptures of the Hindus. Your Mahabharat has got more verses of fighting than the Quran. It will put the Quran to shame as far as verses of fighting is concerned. So the Hindu tells me, no, 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 but this is a fight between truth and falsehood, haq and batil. I said the same fight is in the Quran also. Oh, then we have no problem with the Quran. And the most commonly read scripture among the Hindu scripture is Bhagavad Gita. Bhagavad Gita is nothing but an advice given by Shri Krishna, the God of the Hindus, to Arjun. It's mentioned in Bhagavad Gita chapter number 1, verse number 43 to 46, that Arjun, in the battlefield, he puts his weapons on the ground and he says, I would prefer being killed unarmed than to fight my cousins. Mahabharat is a fight between the cousins, the Pandavas who are five and the Kauravas who are hundred. And Bhagavad Gita is a part of Mahabharata, 25 chapters. He puts his weapon down, Arjun. Bhagavad Gita chapter number one, verse 43 to 46. And he says, I would prefer being killed unarmed than fight my cousins. Immediately few verses after, chapter number two, verse number two, Sri Krishna says, O oh Arjun, how could such impure thoughts come in your mind? How could you be so important? God Almighty, Sri Krishna is calling. You will not enter the heavenly planets. You are incurring a sin. And the full Bhagavad Gita is nothing but advice given by Almighty God to Arjun that he should fight his cousins. It's further mentioned in Bhagavad Gita chapter number 2, verse number 31 to 33. That, oh Arjun, you are a Kshatriya. It is your duty to fight on religious grounds. If you do not fight, you will incur sin. If you fight, you will go to the heavenly planet. And blessed are those Kshatriya who get an opportunity to fight. Imagine if I tell the Hindu, your almighty God, Sri Krishna, is forcing Arjun to kill his cousins. It will be devilish. What he's doing, he's telling that if you have to fight for the truth, even if you have to fight against your cousins, you have to fight. That's what the Quran says in Surah Nisa, chapter number 4, verse number 135. Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu, O oh, you believe, stand out for justice as witness to the truth of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, even if it be against yourself, against your parents, against your relatives, whether rich or poor, Allah protects both. Same thing. And very often, a common hadith is quoted to malign Islam. Hadith of Sahih Bukhari, volume number four, in the book of Jihad, chapter number two. Hadith number 45. And the critics, they quote, Your Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, he said that if a Mujahid is killed in the battlefield, he will go to heaven. If he comes back alive, he gets the wealth of this world. And even the critics of India, like Arun Shuri, they quote this hadith against Islam. I tell them, haven't you read the Bhagavad Gita? Bhagavad Gita says in chapter number 2, verse number 37, Shri Krishna, the God of the Hindu, he is telling Arjun, that, oh Arjun, go and fight. If you are killed, you will go to the heavenly planets, you will go to Swarg, you will go to heaven, to paradise. If you come back alive, you will get the booty of this war. Verbatim translation of Sai Bukhari. Verbatim. I tell these Hindus that haven't you read your own scripture, you want to take out false in the Quran and the Hadith? Based on the guidance given by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ta'ala ila kalmitin sawa im baina baina kum. Come to common terms as us and you. So we Muslims should know how to do dawah, how to convey the message. How to turn the tables over. As I told you earlier, I was in UK. And they say about Muslims. Oh, suicide bombing. Muslims are killing innocent people. There's a book written by an associate professor in political science in the University of Chicago by the name of Robert Pape. He writes a book by the title, Dying to Win. He's supposed to be one of the best experts in suicide bombing, in suicide terrorism. Number one in USA, Robert Pape. The book is Dying to Win. 
he writes in his book that suicide bombing was alien to Islam. If you read the history of Islam, the Quran and the Hadith, do you find any suicide bombing there? No. The first people who got involved in suicide bombing were the Tamil Tigers. Later on, it was the Marxist Leninist. And Robert Pape writes that in Iraq, before the Americans came to Iraq, there was no suicide bombing. After the Americans came, then suicide bombing came. Not a Muslim, a non-Muslim, a Christian, an American who's supposed to be an expert on suicide bombing, Robert Pape. And you can give talks on the books written by Americans and non-Muslims. We should know how to convey the message, the message of Haq. In UK, we know they have a problem of IRA. Fine. It is nothing but Catholic terrorism. But do they label it as Catholic terrorism? No. Why? If any Muslim is involved, Islamic terrorism. Non-Muslims are involved, they talk about the region, not about the religion. Why? This is how the media, it picks up information and they portray it in the wrong way. The media, for example, if it comes in the Indian media, that a 50-year-old Arab comes to India and he marries a 16-year-old girl. Headlines. 50-year-old Muslim Arab marries a 16-year-old girl. But when a 50-year-old non-Muslim rapes a 6-year-old girl, it comes in news brief. I mean, that human being is taking permission of the parents, marrying with permission, giving her due rights. What is the problem? Here a non-Muslim 50-year-old rapes a 6-year-old girl, it comes in news briefs. We know of the Oklahoma bombing. Middle East conspiracy, Middle East conspiracy, continuously. When they came to know it was an American soldier, the news died out in a couple of days. And you can give multiple examples how the media is playing games. And today they say that Islam is the religion which was spread by the sword. A very good reply is given by Delesi O'Leary in his book, Islam at the Crossroad, on page number eight. It says that history makes it clear that the legend of fanatical Muslims sweeping across the world, forcing Islam at the point of the sword over conquered races is the most fantastic myth that historians have ever repeated. Delacy O'Leary, the very famous historian, he says that history makes it clear that the legend of fanatical Muslims forcing Islam at the point of the sword over conquered races is the most fantastic myth that historians have ever repeated. We Muslims, history tells us, ruled Spain for about 800 years. We didn't do our job, we didn't do dawah. Later on, the crusaders came, we were wiped out. There was not a single Muslim who could openly give the azan. We Muslims, we have ruled the Arab lands for the past 1400 years. For a few years, the British just came. For the few years, the French came. But we Muslims have been the lord of the Arab land for the past 1400 years. Yet today, statistics tell us there are 14 million Arabs who are Coptic Christians. Coptic Christian means Christians since generations. If we wanted, we could have converted every Arab into Islam by the point of the sword. We didn't do it. These 14 million Coptic Christians in Arab land, they are bearing witness, they are giving shahada that Islam wasn't spread by the sword. We Muslims, we ruled India for about a thousand years. Today, more than 80% of the Indians, they are non-Muslim. If we wanted, we could have converted every Indian at the point of the sword. We didn't do it. Islam does not give us permission. These 80% non-Muslim Indians, they are giving shahada. They are bearing witness that Islam was inspired by the sword. Which Muslim army went to the east coast of Africa? Which Muslim army went to Indonesia, which has the largest population of Muslims? Which Muslim army went to Malaysia, which has more than 50% Muslim? Which army? Which sword? It is the sword of the intellect.
as Allah says in Surah Nahl, chapter number 16, verse number 125. wal ma'udit al hasna, hasan. Invite all to the way of thy Lord with wisdom and beautiful preaching, and argue with them and reason with them in the ways that are best, most gracious. There was an article, a survey done by Rajas Almanik Yearbook in 1984. It was repeated in the Plain Truth magazine. A survey was done about the increase in the major world religions in a span of 50 years from 1934 to 1984. And number one, the maximum increase was in the religion of Islam, 235%. Christianity, only 47%. I'm asking the question, which war took place in the span of 50 years between 1934 and 1984, which converted millions of non-Muslims to Islam? Which war? Which war? Today, the fastest growing religion in the world is Islam. The fastest growing religion in America is Islam. The fastest growing religion in Europe is Islam. I'm asking, who is forcing these Americans, these Europeans, to accept Islam at the point of the sword? Before 9-11, the maximum allegation about the media was that Islam does not give rights to the women. Do you know, out of those people accepting Islam, including in America and Europe, out of those non-Muslims accepting Islam, two-thirds are women. If Islam degrades the women, then why do these American women, why are these European women accepting Islam? Why? The media is saying that Islam degrades the women, then why are these American and European women accepting Islam? Because Islam has the solution to the problem of womankind, especially the womankind. They find security in Islam. We know Yohan Ridley, she had gone to Afghanistan to spy on the Taliban. She was arrested for seven days. She comes back. She's so much impressed. Time does not permit me to speak about details. Many of you may be aware. She reads the Quran and she accepts Islam. People ask her that, how did the Taliban treat you? They treated me like a guest. The amount of respect they gave her, the amount of modest behavior it was, it changed her heart. And mashallah, today she is wearing a hijab, she lives in London. A British reporter sent to write against the Muslims, Except Islam, Alhamdulillah. And after 9-11, whenever I go to America and Europe, there are more non-Muslims coming to my talk than before. More Americans, more Europeans. I believe in the verse of the Quran, Surah Al-Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 54, which says, Makaru makar Allahu wallahu khairul makreen. They planned and plotted Allah to plan. Allah is the best of planner. After 9-11, in the span of nine months, in USA alone, 34,000 Americans accepted Islam. <laughs> According to Yohan Redley, in a span of nine to 10 months after 9-11, 22,000 Europeans accepted Islam. The more they're attacking Islam, the more Islam is rising. Not because we are doing our job. Wallah, we aren't doing our job. You and I are not doing the job. Allah gives a promise in the Quran in no less than three different places in Surah Saf. Chapter number 61, verse number 9. In Surah Tawbah, chapter number 9, verse number 33. And Surah Fatah, chapter number 48, verse number 20. Allah says, Huwa lazi arsala rasulahu bil huda wa deen al haq liyu zira wa al deen kulle. That Allah has sent his messenger with guidance and the religion of truth so that it will prevail over all the other religions, over all the other ways of life. Islam is destined to supersede all. This religion of peace, this religion of haq will supersede all the other ways of life. And enough is Allah as a witness. However much the non-Muslims don't like it, however much the mushrik don't like it, Islam is destined to supersede all. Allah does not require you and me the rubbish that we are. Allah doesn't require you and me. Allah is sufficient to make his deen prevail. He is giving us an opportunity to do a prophet's job and to earn a prophet's reward. He is giving us an opportunity to dawah. This religion is going to prevail. This deen of haq, this deen of truth, this religion of peace, is bound to prevail. And a very good statement was given by Adam Pearson. He says that people worry that one day nuclear weaponry will fall in the hands of the Arabs. They fail to realize that the Islamic bomb has already been dropped. It fell the day Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was born.
Now let us analyze what does the media say. We'll discuss about each type of media in brief. First, we run the print media. According to an article which came in the Time magazine, on 16th of April, 1979, written by Christian, he writes that more than 60,000 books have been written against Islam in a span of 150 years. From 1800 to 1950, more than 60,000 books have been written against Islam. If you calculate, more than one book is written every day. More than one book is written every day against Islam and against a prophet. And after 9-11, this has reached epidemic levels. Every day, several books are written against Islam. And we Muslims, what are we doing? These Christian missionaries, they are spreading. They are doing their job. They are printing literature and distributing. Here we have one sample. This is, I asked an Arab Sheikh in my last trip, what is this? He read Allah Muhammad. But if you read very carefully, it is not Allah Muhammad, it is Allah Muhabbah, which means God is love. It is a quotation of the Bible from the first epistle of John, chapter number four, verse number 16. God is love, and the verse continues, whoever dwelleth in love, dwelleth in God, and God is in him. Verse of the Bible. If I give it to the Muslims, most of them will kiss it and keep it in the pocket. The moment they see Arabic, Allah's kalam in the pocket. Arabic means if you find any Muslim, any Arabic literature on the floor in India, Pakistan, or any other non Arab countries, when they find, they'll kiss it and put it in the pocket. As though it's Allah's kalam. It is a snake in the house. There are various posters. I didn't have time to get it. When you read it, oh, Rabbana. The moment you see Rabbana, the next verse is Atina, Fit Dunya, Hasna. So we are trained. It is not Rabbana, it is Abbana, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. Verse of the Bible. They distributed among the Muslims. And we, colorful. This is the photocopy. Four color job, beautiful. You put it in your house. They are using deceit. They are using deceit to enter our homes. I have given the talk on deceit by the Christian evangelism. Time doesn't permit me to go into details. That's a lecture by itself. You can speak for us together on each of these topics. And I remember since I subscribed to many of these Christian organizations, I got a beautiful calendar. So one alim in our organization, mashallah, knows Arabic. How do you like the calendar? Oh, beautiful calligraphy. Can I take it home? I said, take it. He keeps it for a week. Then I ask him, how do you like the calendar? Beautiful, Zakir bhai. I said, get it back. I said, why? I said, get it back. Then I said, read it carefully. Then he realizes those are verses of the Bible in Arabic. The Christians have come out with a Bible contextualization, a new Bible. If you read, it reads, Bismillah Rahman Rahim. They are taking verses from the Quran and converting it, changing a little bit as though when Arab read will think it's a part of the Quran, actually it is Bible, known as contextualization. Kitab al-Muqaddas. As I told you, time doesn't permit me. Just in brief, what we Muslims are doing. I come from India, which has a population of more than a billion people, out of which, safely you can say, 160 to 180 million are Muslims. We have many Muslim magazines for dawah purposes, etc. What is the quantity that they print in India? How much? 4,000, 5,000, 8,000. Number one English dawah magazine, Islamic voice, 15,000. I was in America a few years back. Before this trip, I was there. I did a survey. The maximum number of print, any English magazine, Dawa magazine, is by Isna, the message, 50,000. Do you know, there is a small cult in Christianity called as Jehovah's Witnesses. Outcast, they are the mainstream Christian. They print a magazine 
by the name of Watchtower. Do you know how much do they print? Monthly, how much do they print? Can anyone guess? We maximum in USA 50,000. How much do they print? Any guesses? You won't lose any money. Any guesses? How much? Huh? One million! Direct one million. Any other guesses? 50,000. Five lakh. Five million. Five million. One lakh. Hundred thousand. You know how much they print? 20.83 million. Leave aside, we Muslim, we can't print, we can't even think. Leave aside printing, we can't even think. The Christian, a small outcast group known as Jehovah's Witnesses, they print two magazines out of one is Watchtower, which they print semi-monthly, not monthly, twice a month. Each time they print is 20.83 million, more than 20 million in 130 languages. They print every fortnight, twice a month they print. Every time they print is 20.83 million, means every month they print more than 41 million. In 130 languages, the second magazine is awake. They print 16 million twice a month, means more than 32 million. Four color job, they give free. We Muslims leave aside printing, we can't even think. So you don't have to pay any money to guess. Maximum was five million. They print 41 million every month. We can't even think. And they distribute free. Sometimes they keep a nominal price. In India, two rupees. 16 halala. What is 16 halala? Name say, if you want, they'll give you as many copies as you want free. In 130 languages, Watchtower. Awake in 80 languages. This is how they propagate. And one of the media is giving lectures, giving talks. We had a talk, Islam Research Foundation, where I come from, in Bombay. I had a talk in Bombay in Azad Maidan. And it was, a, it was a good, big talk compared to the population. Bombay has a big population, but getting people in Bombay is very difficult. If you get 200 people for an Islamic talk in English, it is great success. That means they have done a great job, because Bombay is a busy city. People don't have time to listen. We did a talk. The press said 200,000 people came. But we know it was 20,000 people. The press exaggerated. We know we were the organizer. I gave a talk on similarities between Hinduism and Islam. 20,000 people came. It was done professionally. We had Jimmy Jibs, big one, not the small one, big Jimmy Jib. We had nine cameras in a good way, professional way. Many Muslims said, ah, they might have spent a lot of money. Now, the lakh to kharcha ki. Nine or ten lakhs. At least one million rupees they might have spent. Israf. They might have spent at least ten lakhs. It is. 80,000 dirhams, at least 20,000 dollars we have spent, Israf. They don't know what we actually spent. What we actually spent was about 28 to 30 lakhs. It is three times more than the estimate. We spent 60,000 dollars, about 250,000 dirhams. You know why I'm telling this? Immediately two weeks after that, Benny Hinn. Who has heard of Benny Hinn? He's an American Christian speaker. He's an American preacher. How many people have heard of Benny Hinn? Raise your hand. Benny Hinn. Hardly 40, 30 people may have raised hand. In an audience of about eight to 10,000 people here, more than 8,000 people, only 20, 30 hands I can see who have heard of Benny Hinn. Unknown. Very popular person. Even I did not know Benny Hinn till he came to Bombay. He comes to Bombay and six weeks after our talk, he has three lectures on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday for three hours each. Three hours each. Friday, Saturday, Sunday. You know how much he spends? People are saying, oh, Dr. Zakir, like $20,000 he spent. Actually, we spent $60,000. If they come to know, they will blame me more. It's rough. You know how much he spent? How much? 
Now he'll have Thailand. He spent five million dollars. Only for nine hours, five million dollars in the city of Bombay. What a budget there, five million dollars. The press said that more than two million people came, but actually less than 100,000 people came. Even getting 100,000 people in Bombay, out of which more than 50% were non-Christians. I went to attend that program. They had these Jimmy Jibs. They had Jimmy Jibs flown from America. Nine American people came two weeks to one month in advance to prepare for the talk. One month staying in a five-star hotel. A white American. He comes three days in advance to check the system. They had 32 screens. You know this screen? That bigger screen than this, 32. We had 500 volunteers. We are proud. 500 volunteers. They had 7,000 volunteers. Christian, not even 3% of the Indian population. They're not even 3%. Five million dollars, they spent more than 20 crore rupees. More than 200 million rupees they spent. Imagine, they flew over the crew. They're only for one program, three hours, three days, and he goes back. If you know the budgets of these Christian missionary organization, on average, it is more than a million dollar a day. Jimmy Swagat, who debated with Sheikh Ahmed Didat, he required more than $400 million annually to keep his head above water. More than $1 million a day is the budget. We are nothing. I don't know for any Islamic Dawah organization in the world which even has 10% of that budget. Any Dawah organization, I have traveled different parts of the world. But the professionalism that they have, these Christian missionaries, they are trained. They are trained in giving talks. We hardly know of any Islamic Dawah organization who trains people in public speaking. Today, scientific research tells us that if a person gives a talk on the stage in public, the matter he speaks carries only 7% weightage. Only 7%. 93% is presentation skills. How does he modulate his voice, his eye to eye contact, his gestures? The reason I don't have a podium is why? Not that I have a very good physique, is because I want to have my body language, even my body speaking. We in Islamic Research Foundation Bombay, we train professionally Muslims how to convey the message of Islam. We train not only Indians, we even train foreigners. We have got Americans who have come to organization. We have got Britishers, people from Singapore, from UAE, from Malaysia, from Saudi Arabia. Scholars who have passed from Madhya University. We train them, we specialize in the field of how to convey the message of Islam. How many Muslim organizations we have? Imagine, how can I die? How can I go in the battlefield without my weapon? If the microphone system is not good, how can I fight? This is my weapon. But when Muslim organizations call me throughout the world, they keep me in a five-star hotel. But the sound system is useless. When I accept an invitation, I tell them, the sound system should be good. I will sleep on the floor, no problem. I don't require a five-star hotel. I'm a die. I can sleep on the floor. But give me a good sound system, it doesn't cost much. But give a professional good sound system. To hire doesn't cost much, it is much less. A small percentage of paying the bill for a five-star hotel. They'll keep me in a five-star hotel, but they don't realize the importance of the sound system. What we Muslims should do, we should train ourselves in the media to specialize in the field of public speaking is a speciality. Print media is a different speciality. Audio media is a different speciality. Video media is a different speciality. We have to be specialized. And today, we have radio broadcast stations. How many Muslims are doing their job? How many? We have the computer, we have the internet. When the internet started, there was more information against Islam than for Islam on the internet. Now, Alhamdulillah, there are some Muslims who have also got into the field. But the Christians are ahead of us. The moment we give a reply, they give the counter reply. On the internet. And the sites are such, I don't want to name them, I don't want to make them popular. The sites are such, you will think it is an Islamic site. You will go to it. It is a snake in your sleeves. The magazine that they print, they have organizations in India, Darul Nijat, Home of Salvation. 
Arabic name. Who is the president? Sultan. Sultan who? Sultan Paul. <laughs> Nidai Umid. Call for hope. It's a Christian organization. So please don't go on names. Same on the internet you go. I don't want to give the names of this site. Otherwise everyone will go. And many will get misguided. They give such information which a normal Muslim even he will not be able to reply. They pick up verses of the Quran and they attack. So as I told you, the media, the media is good as well as bad. It is positive as well as negative, like a knife. It can be used for good purpose and for wrong purpose. If you cut vegetables and bread, it is good. If you use for robbing, it is bad. Similarly, the media has got advantages and disadvantages. It has got positive points, it has got negative points. It has good things, it has got bad things. What we should do, we should utilize the science and technology and turn the tables over and utilize it for good work. Today, majority of the media is used for work which is not good. That's the reason most of the ulama, most of the shiuks, they say that the media stay away from it and I'm for them. I'm not against them, I'm for them. Because most of the thing that comes in your house, the satellite channel, it makes you go away from Islam rather than towards Islam. And today's Taj Sister, the number one media today is the television media, the television satellite media. Today's Taj Sister tell us there are more than 20,000 television stations. 20,000 television stations reaching 5 billion people of the world. More than 80% of the human beings are reached via the television media. This is the survey. Means if you take part in the television media, the television media, the satellite media is reaching 80% of the world population. 5 billion people. And the investment in this media is how much? 400 billion dollars. 400 billion dollars is the investment in this media and people are churning money out of it. The majority, more than 98%, more than 99% is haram. Haram. Obscenity, misinformation, taking away from the truth, more than 99%. We have to utilize it and turn the tables over. Imagine 400 billion dollars invested only in the television media. Christians owning 50 channels, 100 channels, just making money out of it. In America alone, there are 1,673 television stations, out of which 83 are religious channels. Majority, almost all, they are Christian channels. Majority. Throughout the world, there are hundreds of Christian channels. Hundreds. There are Hindu channels. There are Jain channels. How many Muslim channels do we have? How many? In India, we have several Hindu channels. We have in India Christian channels in regional language. In English, we have several channels. We have in the regional South Indian languages only for a part of India. Specialized targeting. There are hundreds of Christian channels. Number one is the God TV. Who has heard of the God TV? Oh, mashallah, more people know of God TV than many him. God TV was launched about 10 years ago in 1995 by a Britisher. But it is uplinked from Israel. Do you know at present they are on 15 different satellites reaching more than 200 countries and having a viewership of 275 million people. 275 million people is the reach. 200 countries, 15 satellites they have hired. The God Channel is one, but there was separate God Channel for Asia, separate for Europe, separate for America, separate for India. Specialization. Like how the BBC. There's BBC World is different, BBC Asia is different, BBC Europe is different. Why? The 90% the matter is same. But they want to 
even take advantage of the prime time. Prime time in UK is different than in UAE. It is different in Bombay. So according to the prime time, they cater the program and they shift the timings. So they hire different satellites. So God channel is one of the most popular among the Christian missionary channels. But Christian channels, there are hundreds of them. How many Islamic channels do we have? I know of many Muslim learning, many entertainment channels. Many, 5, 10, 20, many. I don't want to name them, you may be knowing. They have groups of channels. How many Islamic channels do we have? How many channels do we have for Dawa? The first one that was launched was by Qadiyanis, MTVA, Muslim TV Ahmadiyya. They aren't Muslims. Muslim TV Ahmadiyya, and it even comes in UAE, in Dubai. Muslim TV Ahmadiyya. Normally when you see the channel, you think it's a Muslim channel. The name is also Muslim TV, but they aren't the true mainstream Muslims. They aren't. Alhamdulillah, about eight years back, the first Islamic channel launched was Ikra TV, but mainly it was Arabic. Then we have Majad TV, then we have Fajr. But all these channels, they are basically Arabic channels catering to the Muslim Ummah. They're mainly targeting the Middle East. They are Islamic channels, but you will not call them as Dawa channels. They aren't channels which are propagating Islam to non-Muslims, but mainly catering to the Muslim Ummah. We have other channels which are localized only in Europe. We have other channels which are localized in other parts of the world. What we require is a full-time 24 hours Dawa channel to convey the message of Islam, to remove the misconception what the media is spreading against Islam. I was here a few years back, again, on the invitation of the Holy Quran about Dubai. And that time it came in headlines in the local newspaper, I think it was Khalid Times, that Dr. Zakir Naik calls for an Islamic TV. I had given a lecture in Alboom. The topic was different, but in the question answer session I said, we Muslims require a full-time satellite Dawa channel in English, which is the international language. We have newspapers, which are in local language, only in Urdu. Who reads it? Only the Muslims in India or in Pakistan. We have Arabic newspaper read only by the Arab Muslims. See, this should be there. I'm not saying this is wrong. But what we require is a Dawa newspaper, a Dawa satellite channel. Alhamdulillah, summa alhamdulillah. I always believe in the philosophy that whatever the project is, don't wait if the project is big. See, we are a very small organization. If the project is big, whatever Allah has given you, start with it. If you have a thousand riyals, a thousand dirhams, start with it. Inshallah, you'll get success. So eight years back, we started producing programs for Satellite Channel. And Alhamdulillah, Summa Alhamdulillah, we are supplying every day for half an hour to two hours to more than six international satellite channels. Six, every day. Not only to Muslim channels like Ikra TV, QTV, ARY Digital Islam channel, even to non-Muslim channels, film song channel, ETC, 24th film song, Haram, at least half an hour there is Halal. They see a joker-looking person. They see a joker-looking person. Who's the joker-looking person wearing a coat and a cap and a kufiya and a tie? And somebody is asking a question that why does Islam permit a man to have more than four wives? Ah, I'll be mazaying and now we'll enjoy. And then the reply comes logically and many are convinced. So what we have done, we have always said this is a material free. Don't pay us. Because when we go to that we have spent so many thousands of dollars producing it, the moment we charge, maximum they may show us once a week. We say take it free. And mashallah, most of them show it daily. Because they're getting it free. We will get a sawab in the akhira, inshallah. As I mentioned that few years back in Alboom, I had mentioned that there should be Islamic TV, a Dawa channel. Alhamdulillah, summa alhamdulillah, you'll be happy to know that inshallah, inshallah, in the next two to three weeks, we will be launching an Islamic Dawa channel by the name of Peace TV. We don't have the budget for the Christian missionary. We don't have. We are very small. Small people. Whatever we have, inshallah. 
we have called it the peace tv so the media is with war with islam but we are with peace with humanity peace in arabic salam it also means islam and inshallah it will be a dawa oriented channel initially reaching europe australia africa middle east and asia will be on panam sat 10 initially later on within a few months we'll even go to usa inshallah and very shortly within one year inshallah we'll try and cover this full globe inshallah it will basically be an english satellite channel but we don't want to lose the time which is not a prime time what is not prime time in europe and the english countries it will be prime time in india and pakistan that time we will show programs in hindi and urdu so that we also want to cover the non muslims of india so 25% initially will be in hindi and urdu 75% will be in english inshallah and i request you to pray to allah subhanahu wa taala that inshallah with this peace tv will be able to spread the religion of peace throughout the world inshallah we muslims should basically know how to turn the tables over i would like to give one more example before i end my speech that for the past few months those people who belong to the indian subcontinent and now it has spread internationally you know of the issue of sania mirza have you heard of sania mirza wow wow mashallah see everyone knows why because of the media everyone knows of sania mirza why because of the media and the media gave her publicity you know why why because she was a muslim not only because she was a muslim because she was a muslim and wearing clothes skirts and shorts it happened so that last issue of time magazine I think it was the last week of September or the first week of October 2005 she came on front page Sania Mirza front page wearing a skirt and playing tennis why you know why all of us know for the past couple of months the media was giving a hype the fatwa was there that what clothes she is wearing the mini skirt says haram it is prohibited and there's a big hue and cry all the media all the television channels going to muslim ulama and scholars is it right or wrong and most of them saying haram 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 and blowing it out of proportion this is what the media does it uses information and the way it presents it so non muslim will think what kind of a religion is this there is a sports woman and the religion is trying to stop her what is then islam is haq we can't change it what is wrong is wrong but how do you convey the message is important allah says in surah nahl chapter number 16 verse number 125 udu ila sabili rabbika bil hikma wal mu'azzat al hasna wajadun bil lati hasan invite all to the way of thy lord with wisdom and beautiful preaching and argue with them and reason with them in the ways that are best most gracious when i was given the opportunity i normally don't speak to the media i've got my own reasons to the normal media and i'll tell you why later on I'll tell you why later on. But we normally have a weekly gathering in Bombay where I handle question and session. There are a few hundred people who gather there, and then this question was asked to me, and I told them that you should know how to reply to the media. My first question to the international media is that why are you going and asking the Muslim ulama, the Muslim shiuk, the Muslim scholars whether the clothes Sania Mirza is wearing is right or wrong? She is only 34th seed. How much? 34th seed. Why don't you go and ask the Christian priest about Serena Williams? Serena Williams is seat number one. Why don't you go and ask the Christian priest <laughs> that what clothes Serena Williams is wearing is right or wrong? Why don't you ask? Why don't you go and ask the Pope in Vatican that the clothes Serena Williams and most of the people above Sania Mirza, 33 majority are Christians. Why don't you go and ask the Christian priest and the Pope the clothes she's wearing is right or wrong? If you read the Christian Bible, the Bible says in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter number twenty-two, verse number five, the woman shall not wear clothes that which pertains to a man, and a man shall not wear woman's clothes. 
all those who do that are an abomination to the Lord. It's mentioned in the first Timothy chapter number two, verse number nine, that the woman should be dressed up modestly with sobriety. They should not wear braided hair or gold or pearls or costly array. A Christian woman is supposed to be covered. You see the example of the nuns. How are the nuns? The nuns are dressed up like the Muslima. If you have seen the photograph of Mother Mary, may Allah be pleased with her, she's completely covered from head to toe. Only her face and hands up to the rest is seen. You go and ask the Pope or the Christian priest, if a nun takes out her hijab and if she plays tennis in the skirts, what fatwa will you give? What opinion will you give? For us, every Muslima, every Muslim woman is as pious as the nuns according to them. They're modest. We should know how to reply to the media. There were two groups amongst the Muslims. Most of the ulmas and shaykhs, they said it is wrong. A couple of them, they give the fatwa right from where, I don't know. But the so-called modern Muslim, inverted commas, you know what they said? In sports, why should Islam come in between? <laughs> One Muslim politician said that these shaykhs, these ulmas, they don't know about sports, so they should keep their mouth shut. I am telling this politician, if he does not know Islam, he should keep his mouth shut. <laughs> there were Hindu politicians who said that Sania Mirza is the pride of our country. Any Indian who speaks against Sania Mirza is a desh dohi, is unpatriotic statements. I told that any person who supports the clothing of Sanya Mirza is going against the Vedas. Because the Hindu Veda says in Rig Ved, book number 10, hymn number 85, verse number 30, the woman shall not wear clothes of the man and the man should not wear clothes of the wife. It further mentioned Rig Ved, book number 8, hymn number 33, verse number 19. It says that Brahma, Almighty God, has made you a woman, so lower your gaze and wear the veil. So in Hindu scripture also wearing skirts is haram. So any Indian who's supporting wearing skirt, I told that Hindu politician is going against the Hindu scriptures. Turn the tables over. Why are we in the firing line? Why don't they ask the Hindus? Is it an Indian culture? And further, there was another Hindu politician who said that this is international sports. All these politicians, they belong to the same, the Hindu, Muslim, Christian. <laughs> Most of them, the birds of the same feather flock together. You know what did the Hindu politician, they said, it is an international sport. So you should maintain the dress code of the international sports. And people don't know that the clothes she wears, it improves the performance. I say, okay, I agree with you. We have to agree that the clothes that they prescribe, maybe the performance will be better. How much? Half percent? One percent? Agree. Don't argue. But if we see in history, 20 years back, 25 years back, 15 years back, when women wore dresses while playing sports like badminton, they wore full dresses. Even today in Iran, women are wearing full dresses, wearing scarves and playing. Even if I agree with you that the performance is better wearing shorts, I'm asking the Hindu politician, tomorrow if beach volleyball becomes an international sport, will you send your daughter? Will she wear bikinis? <laughs> tomorrow if beach volleyball becomes an international sport, so will you send your daughter wearing a bikini to play beach volleyball? Will the Indian culture give you permission? And we have to agree that in swimming, people wear less clothes, so that they can perform better. That day the gents only wear a brief and the woman they wear a bikini. But you have to understand and agree that if you wear no clothes, you will get the best performance. So will you prescribe the woman to swim nude? <laughs> Why the double standards? You say, no, no, that is immodest. So your modesty level is here, our modesty level is here. Where is the cutoff point is important. 
What is modest for you is not modest for me. So why don't you prescribe that in swimming, the men and the women, they should swim nude. It will improve the performance, but no. They have the modesty level. So we should know how to reply and turn the tables over. Unfortunately, we are like sitting ducks. We have made ourselves a laughing stock in the media. Coming to the question, how should the ulmas reply? I am not against the ulmas because they aren't trained in the media. Normally, if someone asks me the Islamic viewpoint, what does Islam say about Sanya Mirza being a sportswoman and she's wearing such clothes? Is it right or is it wrong? My reply would be, before I speak about Sanya Mirza, I would like to tell you that there are Muslim gents who play cricket in Indian teams and the other teams. Many of them don't offer Salah. Sahih Muslim says in the book of Salah that the difference between Iman and Kuf is Salah. Salah is the most important pillar after Tawheed. Very important. The biggest sin after Shirk is not offering Salah. So according to me, the Muslim Jain sportsmen who play cricket and don't offer Salah are bigger sinner than Sanya Mirza. At least Sanya Mirza offers Salah. The Muslim actors and actresses, they do shirk on the screen. They are bigger sinners. I am not trying to defend Sanya Mirza. I have to agree, the clothes Sanya Mirza is wearing is against Islam. It is haram. But before I say this, I am diluting the effect. This is hikmah. I am diluting. The moment I say Christianity is against it, the effect is diluted. Hinduism is against it, the effect is diluted. Judaism is against it, the effect is diluted. I am speaking about swimming. I am speaking about cricket. But when I give the answer, it is haram. It goes down their throat very well. Otherwise, they cannot digest it. I am saying that fine, at least Sanya Mirza is offering Salah. She is a lesser sinner than those Muslim cricketers who don't offer Salah. Full day cricket, five day cricket without Salah. Allah has given her Hidayah to offer Salah. Maybe tomorrow she will wear proper Islamic clothes, inshallah. And the question whether she can play in a mixed gathering, that's another question. That doesn't mean I'm giving a fatwa, what she's doing is right. But we Muslims should know how to turn the tables over, how to give a reply with hikmah. The moment you give this reply, the whole thing is tuned down. Unfortunately, we make a laughing stock of ourselves in front of the media. Normally, I don't give my interviews in front of media. Why? Suppose I'm giving answer of five minutes. Most of the time, they purposely edit it and give a different picture of my answer. Sometimes, due to lack of time, they shorten it. And in ignorance, they give a different answer. So either they do it purposely most of the time, so that if my answer is effective, they will cut it and edit it. And the whole answer will seem to be something else. Or out of ignorance, while making it short, the answer seems to be different. That's the reason I purposely avoid, though I get calls from various media, from various international media to give interviews and all, I avoid most of the time. Inshallah, when we have our own channel, then we can have the correct picture. We can give them copies of our tape. You want to show? Show this. If you edit it, the full version is there on our channel, inshallah. <laughs> and starting a channel is one thing which is difficult. Second is, starting a channel and running on the guidelines of Quran and Sai Hadith is more difficult. So inshallah, I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you pray that we stay on the right track in this channel on Quran and Sai Hadith and we're able to convey the message. And I'd like to end the talk with the verse of the Quran of Surah Isra, chapter number 17, verse number 81, which says, وَقُلْ جَالْ حَقْ وَزَاقَ الْبَاطِلِ إِنَّ الْبَاطِلَ كَانَ زَهُوكَ When truth is hurled against falsehood, falsehood perishes. For falsehood is by its nature bound to perish. وَاَخْرُ دَعْوَانَا الْحَمْدُ لِلَّهِ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ اقرأ وخيّا ورتل القرآن اصبح بصوتك اسمع الأكوان اقرأ كلام الله داوي نفوسنا لنحب
حس في أعماقنا أعماقنا الإيمان